This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome to Man Library's podcast of its public program series. In a special light and winter lecture at Man Library on January 24, 2010, Cornell PhD candidate in the Department of Horticulture, Chad Miller details the history of the tulip. From its origins in Asia to modern cultivation and the place the tulip takes in the coveted table bouquets of spring. I am Chad Miller. I'm a PhD graduate student in the Department of Horticulture. I have been here for several years. Uh, this is my last year. Um, no, first and last first year, last year, whatever you want to say. I'm applying for jobs, so if that makes, makes it any faster, I'm moving out. Um, so uh, anyways, I uh, did my master's here as well, uh, PhD, uh, undergraduate in horticulture from the University of Wisconsin River Falls, also in horticulture, so I'm a purebred. Um, and flowers are my thing, and um, if you read the little bio, um, I have spent my undergraduate internship in the Netherlands. Uh, I spent a year between my master's and PhD in the Netherlands doing some research at two different locations on bulb research, uh, breeding. Um, I am not Dutch. I pass for Dutch, but I'm kind of a Dutch wannabe. So um, anyway, so how did, how did I get to do this talk? Well, they, they contacted me, asked me if I want to do anything on flowers for the light and winter and, and uh, coordinate with Millie's uh, exposition. So. And I said, sure, and then I asked to look at her. I asked her to see what she was going to put in the show so it might direct me a little flowers wide open. I could, and I can talk, as you can tell. So I'm going to have to make sure I get through my 75 slides in the hour. So um, <clears throat> she said, she, she sent me the, the list of her, her, um, her pieces of work she was going to put in. And um, I can move past the intro slide. And this was one of the, one of the pieces you'll see up there. Um, and as soon as I saw the tulip, obviously, I was like, okay, I have some little lead here. And there are several other bulb, uh, there are several other bulb pieces in the, in the exposition up there. So, um, but when I saw the tulip, I thought, well, <clears throat> why don't I talk about the tulip? And it has a timeline, and uh, Millie's work captures, like, moments within, like, days in her work. But we can also capture a moment in the tulip itself, but it has a longer timeline, I'd say. And so... Um, as I read her, her bio on her website, two passages sort of stuck out, stuck out to me. Um, one was, I detect the worlds within worlds and the journeys within is always an adventure, entrancing, delightful, endlessly fascinating. And I thought that kind of described me to a T in my zest and passion for floriculture. So uh, I sort of combined that with Millie's ideas as well. And the second part was, when my own pleasure in such enthralling work communicates itself to you, the viewer, then the plant form is truly celebrated. So I hope to give you a little more insight into the tulip um, and its history, uh, the production of the tulip, the bulbs, where they come from, how we get them, uh, including some of the numbers of the tulips, which can be astonishing, I think, when some people uh, realize that, some breeding and some production type. So being light in winter and science theme in there as well, you'll get some science in here. I'll try to keep some of it pretty straightforward, and some of it I have worked on uh, in the Netherlands and everything. So um, if there are questions, if it's kind of a brief one, I'll entertain it. But at the end, I hope to leave a little bit of time for questions. I'll try to hurry myself through it. So um, I'd like to thank the horticulture department and the landscape, and, uh, uh, landscape architects department uh, for their support, especially with the Drew Award that gave me, that really <coughs> um, strengthened that, this passion I have for floriculture and the time I could spend in the Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Bill Miller, who is my current PhD advisor, Dr. Tom Weiler and Dr. Uh, Mark Bridgen were, uh, are still both faculty, but they were on my master's committee. Dr. Jotpentel and Dr. Hank Kuda, uh, two Dutch researchers that I worked with while I was there, uh, became very good friends and uh, perhaps will be instrumental in me getting a job maybe with the Dutch. Uh, the CU Dutch program and Martina Briggs, uh, I took some Dutch before I went back over so I could actually fit in, and I think I accomplished that a little bit. And then, of course, the light and winter and the man uh, library staff for setting all this up and giving me the opportunity to do this. So I got that out of the way, and I don't have to rush. So, Okay, <clears throat> this is a pretty familiar picture. I'm, I'm assuming many people have seen the windmills and the tulips. First inkling that people think is the tulip is native to Holland. But quite frankly, 
not native to the Netherlands. So one of, these most one of the most recognizable flowers in the garden, the story of it. So we'll start over here in Central Asia in what I call the Stan area, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Stan and Stan and Stan, all in this area here. <coughs> and the Tian Shan uh, region, uh, mountain region, is where the tulip, uh, over a, depending on the source you look at, 120 to 150 species of tulips originate in this area. And actually, they're native all along this area and even parts of northern Africa and southern, uh, northern parts of the Mediterranean there. But the primary, <coughs> excuse me, tulip species are native to this region here. And according to uh, a lot of records, they were being grown over here, uh, and early records report 1000 AD. Uh, <coughs> they moved via traveling and uh, westward expansion or traveling west uh, to find the new worlds. Uh, in the 15s and 1520s to the 1560s was the actual tulip area in, Turk in Turkey. So uh, that was the, the first part of their history. And once they made it to Turkey, the tulip was a well-celebrated, uh, well well-recognized flower in most of their gardens, put in window boxes, put in gardens of the wealthy, uh, large gardens in the cities, uh, and a lot of their uh, clothing. And this is an Iznik tile. They made beautiful tiles, and you can see that uh, a lot of the decor had tulips in them. Um, you notice that the tulips <coughs> that they desired were actually long and pointed, like this one here. This is actually tulip acuminata, uh, and the Turks early on preferred these large lance uh, sword-like uh, tulip petals in theirs. As compared to, this is a very modern day tulip, which is very egg-shaped, oval-like, uh, what they call almost almond shape. They did start to like this a little bit, uh, but primarily they, they, they like this spidery, uh, uh, torch-looking sort of tulip. Uh, they would adorn. <coughs> Records show that they would adorn their dresses, their underwear. Uh, a lot of their gowns all had tulips and uh, adorning them. So the tulip w was a favored flower among the Turks. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> yeah, so how did the tulip get its name? Uh, it comes from the Turkish, the Turkish word for a tulip was lala or dolben, which uh, uh, anglicized was became turban um, and because they thought it uh, fit the shape of the flower. So if we go back to this one, I guess it sort of uh, fits that shape a little bit if you use your imagination, I suppose. But if they were liking these, I'm not sure where it came from. However, I think it actually sort of fits a tulip bulb, <coughs> perhaps. So tulip ben, tulip bulb, something on that order. I don't know. Uh, <coughs> the interesting part, going through the, uh, some of the uh, readings for the historical part of the tulip, there are several different uh, versions, and the, there's nothing uh, very, very clear at this point. Uh, if you've ever had, if you've had the chance, or perhaps you have, uh, the tulip by Anna Poverd is a pretty good uh, uh, book that uh, describes the history of the tulip as well. She, and actually, she will be here. Jenny, won't she? Uh, we have a North American Flower Bulb Wholesalers Association meeting in March, and Anna Povert is actually going to be here. Here in Ithaca? Here in Ithaca. Ithaca. Yes. Um, some, somewhere around spring break time. So um, I'm not sure if she's going to give a public presentation or not, but I, I think so. So keep that on your calendar. Craig's nodding yes. So if you have her book, she's got a new book called The Tulip. Bring it, get it signed, see her. I've never met her, but I heard she's a, a fantastic Brit, right? So anyways, moving on, tulips. Like I said, I'm going to run out of time. So it made its way from uh, the Stan area, uh, Central Asia, to Turkey. And then from Turkey, it did make its way over into Europe. Uh, so 1557, the first tulip drawings uh, were, were seen in Western Europe. Uh, 60, <coughs> excuse me, 1561, the first tulip was found in a book, uh, a drawing by... Uh, <coughs> Uh, Charles Gesner, and actually, if we, in, in uh, uh, Conrad Gesner, excuse me. I got very little sleep. I think I'm getting a cold, so <clears throat> bear with me. Uh, and that's why I need a water here. So, Conrad Gesner, uh, the first picture in a book by him, and actually, one of the tulip species is, he's honored by uh, the tulip Kesneriana, is named after uh, Conrad. So, the, the tulip, how it got its name? Tulip. It came from the, the Turkish word lala or dolband, and 
as, it, as the tulip moved west and the, the Anglos made the, the conversion, somehow in there they made a connection. I don't know. The, yeah. T. Okay, okay. Thank you. I, somehow that way I, I assumed that. In Dutch, t, D and T is also sort of mixed. So as it comes west. Yeah. No problem. I should have elaborated on that. Okay. So uh, 1561, the first tulip was seen in a book by Eva Gesner. And then in 78, the tulip had made its way to England. 93 to the Netherlands, which is right here. Actually, the Netherlands and lowland lying countries of Belgium as well. Um, and then in 1598 to France. But we're most concerned about the Netherlands, per se. Um, I am, and that's where really the tulip started. Um, 1593, uh, the tulip arrived in Leiden at the botanical gardens there, uh, basically the only university in the lowland countries at that time. Um, and the main, the head honcho there was Carolus Clusius, um, and he was a well-renowned botanist who had came over, come over from Vienna. Um, and he had a friend who sent him some tulip seeds uh, around uh, 1593, he planted them, uh, very shriveled up, and he got a few seeds to grow. And so <clears throat> by 1594, he had the first flowers happening in, in the lowland countries in the Netherlands. And <clears throat> by the 1600s, up uh, in the north, north, north Holland, near Harlem, they had actually feel, fields of tulips or uh, populations of tulips growing and flowering. During this time at, uh, at Leiden, at the university, at the gardens. Uh, Clusius began breeding work. He had several kinds of tulips, and he was, with all of his contacts throughout uh, Central Europe, or Central Asia, he was able to get other species of tulips and bring them in to start doing some actual hybridizing. And so this is what really, uh, was really the impetus for the beginning of what we call the tulip mania, or the, the, the craze about tulips. So this began in 1610, so you'll see that some of the first flowers, it took about 15 to 20 years before the, this tulip mania actually took hold. And many of you probably recognize some of these uh, tulip flowers here as part of the tulip mania craze. They're very beautiful. The, the craze was over this breaking pattern that you see in all of these here. And that, with Clusius's crossings, started to see some of this. And visitors to the garden noticed this and they became very interested in them because mostly tulips come, were coming in reds, whites, oranges, perhaps purples. And so they start seeing this breaking pattern happening and became very interested and they wanted them. He would only share those usually with his closest friends. However, as I mentioned, they were starting to grow flowers up in the northern part of Holland, uh, probably uh, 100 to 150 miles from Leiden, if that, where these other flower growers were starting to to establish. Well, when he said no, they wanted them anyways. So they started to steal them. And when they started stealing them, uh, Clusio was getting up in age and he decided to say, I'm done with it. And he dispensed of all his collection to any growers and people who want, mostly to friends, but because people kept stealing his collection, they dispersed, not necessarily by his desire. So during this whole craze, um, people went mad. I mean, it, it was, it was a, a mad, a madhouse. Um, people were speculating on prices for these things. People started raising them. Um, they wanted this breaking pattern to happen. No one was sure how this happened. Nobody understood inheritance of hybridizing or anything at that point in time that well. And so they were dumping ink on the ground. They were dumping milk on the ground. If they had a red tulip, they were dumping chemicals, whatever, you thought, whatever they thought they could do to make this breaking pattern happen. And one of the particular uh, notable uh, cultivars uh, was this one here of Semper Augustus, and this is a, a depiction of it. This was a documented 1636 bill of sale, and you can see several of the things that they traded uh, for one bulb of, of this tulip. One bulb, which usually had a larger mother bulb and maybe three or four daughter bulbs with it, perhaps. So we see 24 tons of wheat, uh, four fat oxen, a silver drinking cup, a thousand pounds of cheese, 
uh, a marriage bed with linen, so you can have your wine with that, and a whole ship to take everything with it. So 3,000 guilders. So it might be kind of hard to see in the back, but for in comparison, so that was 3,000 guilders for one bulb of this. 250 guilders was the annual salary of a carpenter in the 1630s. So we're talking uh, one-eighth of that or less. Yeah, 750 guilders for a, a Clusius at the University in Leiden. That was his salary. And then 1,600 guilders was Rembrandt's fee for the Night Watch, one of the most uh, prized uh, pieces of work that Rembrandt ever did. So people were crazy about these things, and they speculated, and they speculated, and they, they were buying bulbs before tulips were even blooming. And they would, they would trade hands three to four to five times before it was even lifted out of the ground. So this, this happened for several years. Um, and we see uh, several artists uh, during the Dutch Golden Age, painting was flourishing and, and well-renowned artists were painting. And actually, uh, so here's several depictions of it in a couple of Oskart's uh, paintings. It was actually cheaper to commission a painting of one of the tulips than it was to actually gain the tulip itself. So there are several pieces of art uh, that show this and document it well. And just a side note, there's actually a recent, a book was recently published and I got one and I should have brought it actually. Um, there's a mystery tulip painter that he or she has painted a lot of these and never signed their work, but are very, um, very helpful in, in trying to put the timeline together of how this sort of played out. Um, the mystery of the tulip painter, I think is what it's called. So, um, but yeah, anyways. So they, did, they painted these and they were trading them. Um, lo and behold, they didn't know what the problem was, but actually the problem was a very bad problem because it was a virus. It was called tulip breaking virus. And here we see some um, scanning electron micrograph of the negatively stained virons that are, I mean, very, very small. Clusius mentioned it in 1576 that he thought there was something viral-like happening with these multicolored tulips. And the thing with a virus plant, most generally, it becomes weaker. Uh, breaking patterns happen. And actually down here, so this is one cultivar actually came out of our greenhouse trials. It looks like it's supposed to be red, right? And we got this one right here. So we get some uh, breaking and a whole other color happening. And in this light, it'll be very difficult to see, but <clears throat> Often it's easy to see those, but this one also has breaking virus. One's closer to the front, you might see streaks right here. That is a virus tulip as well. So Clusius had an idea that there was something wrong with these tulips, but people didn't know it. And so this just exacerbated this, this tulip mania because they were trying to increase the number of bulbs, but a virus plant typically is it's dying, it's going downhill. So they were trying to get as many bulblets as they could, but it was is going against nature's will. Exactly. And so they're, they're, they're betting their farm and their, their country basically on these little bulbs. And so little do they know that they're, they're betting on virus. And then in 1930, Cayley and McKay found this link that they found the, the transmission, the aphids and the other bugs that would transmit this and then they isolated this and, and that's the story. So it's still a problem. Um, however, um, it is actually, Illegal for any Dutch grow or any well, yeah, any Dutch grower to sell anything that they know might be virus. Um, it's illegal. They have bred. Um, no, I don't have it. Actually, the first slide here. These are not virus. The the breeders because people love this. The breeders went to work and they started selecting for. Uh, they made crosses to select for this sort of a thing. They are not. No, but they will come through. Like I just showed you here. This happened in our greenhouse. They come through. Um, but these are called what they call the Rembrandt tulips. Rembrandt himself never painted any of these, but because it was the, during the Dutch golden, the, the painting era, the, the golden painting era, era um, they named them after Rembrandt to sort of honor him, kind of. But, so these are Rembrandt tulips, perfectly safe uh, to grow. The breeders went to work and they did a really good job. Um, there are a few particular cultivars that are really good. Um, <clears throat> so. Because this was happening, people became very uh, cynical of it, and so some artists also went to work not depicting the flower, but depicting the stupid people. And this is Peter Nopel's, uh, Nopel's uh, Flora's Hex Cap, which translates into Flora's Crazy Cap. So this looks like sort of a crazy cap, and if you look closely, this looks like a whale's mouth, perhaps, with an eye. And inside here are tulip barterers and traders. They're in there dealing on the bulbs. 
and the whale is going to come to eat them, or it's just a fool's cap that's sitting inside. Um, there's a lot going on in this picture and the next one, but here's Flora herself, the goddess of flowers. She's riding an ass, and followed by all these peasants. Uh, right here's the devil, and they have a, a, a Christmas flag here with two wrestlers depicting how stupid this is. We have people dumping bulbs here. Um, yeah, so they, they really made fun of the, uh, of the people doing this. As did Jan Uh Here we have a whole group of monkeys. And we have some tulips down here that have some breaking going on. We have someone out uh, recording. And then we have somebody over here selling them. And then we have other monkeys doing whatever they want. And actually, there is one in here. Oh, that's a close-up of the seller, but there's one in here taking, uh, actually urinating on the tulips. So <laughs> there's a lot going on in these. You could spend hours looking at these. So, but not only did they paint them to honor the tulip itself, but they painted them to painted to honor the idiot. So, all right, that's sort of a, a history. I could talk hours and hours on that, but I want to kind of give you the timeline of the tulip, how we get it here in our tabletop, as the title suggests. So. The tulip, <clears throat> uh, just got this number actually. So there's a last year, uh, two years ago, about 24,000 acres of tulips produced in the Netherlands. This, most of the figures you'll see now are just for the Netherlands alone. For the most part, almost all tulip bulbs that we see here in the United States come from the Netherlands. There is some bulb production that happens out in Oregon and California, but not to the extent that happens in the Netherlands. Um, there are about 3,000 plus registered cultivars, which are listed in this book. Uh, which actually should probably be a bit thicker because I think this was 1997's book. So all tulips that want to be registered, can be registered, the Dutch have the authority of that. Um, the Koninklijke uh, Algemeen Railing business people. So this book, basically all but 20 pages is cultivar listings and they describe every cultivar and perhaps the parentage of some of the tulips, which is actually useful for breeders if they are doing that. So kind of interesting. 75% of the bulbs are exported, mostly to the United States, Japan, Germany, United Kingdom, Italy, and France. Um, not necessarily in that order. I think Japan is number one, uh, Germany two, U.S. three. <coughs> uh, for cut flower? Yeah, so third most popular cut flower, rose, and probably, Elster, no, not Elstermeria, mum. I'm guessing mum. Um, they jostle around. They, they, they jostle around. But rose is number one. So, and in 2008, uh, it was a, uh, the cut flowers coming out of the Netherlands was valued at 223 million euro, which pretty much doubled that, I guess, for dollars. Um, just <clears throat> give you an idea, uh, these are the major bulb crops. Uh, you can see most acreages are going down, actually, over the years. Uh, <clears throat> and that's because Netherlands is a country of about 18 million people, and it's a si twice the size of New Jersey, and about one third of it is under sea level. And so this is, if you can see this against the green, I guess it's not that good there. This is the United, uh, United States, um, Netherlands, and you see these dots. That's actually where most of the bulb farms are located in the Netherlands. So Leiden is right about here. Uh, Amsterdam is right about there. And so this is what they call North Holland, South Holland here. And so you see, this is what they call the Blumenballen streak or bulb streak. That's where a lot of the uh, uh, bulb production happens, as is right here. So Alkmaar is right there. Um, but this here is very, very sandy soil. Perfect, perfect growing condition for tulip bulbs, especially for export. Because exporting to like the United States, they ha legally cannot have any soil on them. Much easier to wash off sand than it is to wash off a loam. No. The question was, does that mean they'll grow better no matter where you put them? No, it doesn't necessarily translate into that. This is more for just harvesting. A lot of the export bulbs come from here. So this area right here, you see a large concentration right there. This area here is called Flavoland. That's the newest part. So this is the Eiselmere Sea. This part here was reclaimed by the Dutch, I think, in the 50s. So it's not that old. It's only 50, 40, 50 year old land. They dredged the sea here and they built this up. And right here, a lot of bulb production happens, actually mostly lily production. But as I keep going, if I hurry up, you'll see some bulb lifting. And I, a friend, we have Dutch interns. I should have mentioned this in the beginning. Our program is a, a Dutch bulb research program. So I don't work with tulips. I work with minor crop oxalis. 
but uh, we work with tulips all the time and we get a Dutch intern every year and so make friends and if we go over we visit with them and so uh, this this person here was uh, Mark uh, yeah Mark Pines um, so anyways <clears throat> you can see the bulb uh, production but primarily centered right around here not to mention that it's very uh, accessible to uh, the shipping ports uh, Rotterdam is down here actually right here so very easy for shipping to get the bulbs out okay <clears throat> tulip breeding so how do we get all these cultivars well <clears throat> most of the most of the important cultivars that we see today I should mention of the 3,000 cultivars about 120 maybe 150 are really produced or cultivated in the sense that we get a lot and of those 120 probably 15 to 20 are are the major cultivars um, for forcing production that is for gardening yeah it, it broadens up to 75 to 100 probably so the two major <coughs> species involved in our modern day tulips are tulip Kisneriana and Fosteriana. Here's Hesner, the one that is uh, named after him. And they uh, generally refer to these as the Darwin hybrids. But because the, the records for early tulip breeding was not very well kept, uh, it's not sure if this is the case that those are always the parents or if there's just uh, intraspecific crosses that these happen to be. So, uh, and there's some genetics, two and, uh, 24 chromosomes for most. So, I keep coming out of it right here. Um, so this is part of the project I sort of helped with in the Netherlands. That's why I'm sort of giving it to you and inserting some science into this. Um, so the Fosteriana uh, group is resistant to the tulip breaking virus, so that would help to get that in most tulips. Um, but however, it has poor greenhouse forcing qualities, doesn't do well. Uh, poor flower characteristics, small, not very, um, doesn't open very well. Uh, but it is earlier flowering, which helps uh, provide cultivars for a longer force, getting different staging and forcing. Uh, on the Tulip Kesneriana side, uh, it's resistant to Fusarium oxysporum, which you can see some symptoms down here, which is a very uh, detrimental fungus to tulip bulbs, especially during shipment and storage, which can ultimately lead to ethylene production and tulip bud abortion. So growers can get these and they grow, but don't flower. Not a good thing especially if you plant 50 acres of them. Yeah. Uh, they do have some resistance to Botrytis tulipiae, uh, which you see down here, <coughs> which most often comes out in the flower, uh, white spots, flecks, and then uh, water-soaked looking type leaves. <coughs> Excuse me. They do have the desirable flower characteristics, usually larger, uh, ovate sort of uh, looking flowers, and they can be a bit on the later flowering. So you can see if we could cross these two, which most of them have, and if, especially if we can get this uh, breaking virus into this Hesneriana because they have a few more, a few better qualities, that's what the goal is. <clears throat> so how, what are we breeding for? Well, obviously new colors and forms. Uh, interesting, this was a new cultivar that we tried a couple years ago. It, it's very fringed. It has a Russian name, Cheny Serhi Velkilovyev, something like that. has very small... Uh, flowers, but is very, very fringed. Fringed so much that that's open, fully open. It just fringed so much, it just fringed itself together. Um, but actually really cool because the fringes come down the mid ribs of the petals like that. So kind of exotic. Some people either like it or they don't. So, uh, And on this side, new forms, new co I mean new colors. So this is here is Kalur Cardinal. Uh, first reported to uh, have been grown in 1845. These two here are sports of it, just genetic mutations that happen naturally. Uh, Princess Irene and Rococo. This is a double uh, parrot type tulip. So these, imagine having uh, 100,000 of these and they found this one growing out there. They harvested it, propagated it, and then we have this new cultivar. Same thing with that. And then this mutated, this one, Orange Princess, basically just the double. And Princess Irene was one of the Dutch princesses. So Here's one of the Dutch. Yes, by genetic mutation. So as cells divide, something goes wrong with the DNA uh, chromosome. <laughs> these they did not breed on. Whoops. These they did not breed on purpose. They, they found these. Breed. They you can breed them like that. Yeah. So a lot of cultivars actually happen like this. When you're planting out, you've seen all the fields of tulips happening in the Netherlands. When you have millions of bulbs happening like that, this is bound to happen every now and then. But if it's a keeper, that's the next question. I mean, it like, might look nice, but it might not do what people want it to do for what specific purpose. 
So that's what the, we're looking for. And so here's a little bit of the breeding work. Um, inside the tulip bulb after they're harvested, there's the, the 2B flower for next year right there. Uh, we would harvest those. I would make some crosses. There's a pollinated tulip. And then we'd look at, we would gas these tulips with laughing gas. So um, we're, we're trying to restore fertility to bulbs. So when you take an, one genus, Kesneriana, and another genus, uh, Fosteriana, you cross them, it's an interspecific, the resulting pollen is most often sterile. So if you're going to try to make a cross with that new one, you, it's, it's, a dead, it's a dead thing. So when you try to restore the pollen to one of these, this F1 hybrid, uh, by interrupting the microsporogenesis, the sperm cell development. We try to interrupt it at a certain stage. So we had to dissect these when they were doing their little thing and they're dividing to make the pollen for next year. And so that's what happened. We'd gas them with laughing gas, uh, which is good because it gases permeate all of the tissue very easily. <clears throat> we did it for 48 hours. And you can see here, so part of microsporogenesis, it, it ends up into a tetrad. You get four pollen grains for, for gamete production. We try to stop it when it has divided twice. And so you can see here, there's one. And here's chromosomes that are starting to separate, so probably metaphase. And you see some more chromosome uh, uh, division right there. And there's just, uh, this is a blob that has, the chromosomes are still all bundled up in the cell. It hasn't, hasn't started segregating out the chromosomes. And here you start seeing it more. And up there is a really good picture, actually. So kind of cool for breeding work. That was really cool for me. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but also very complicated and gets me, I was, I was dreaming about this. Well, I wasn't dreaming because I was awake. But I was like, is that right? Is that wrong? So anyways, uh, here after gassing and then letting them continue, here is some pollen from a tulip, and it's hard to definitely see in this lighting, actually. See this larger white dot there, larger white dot there, there? There's a really good one. That's 2N pollen. That's a re <coughs> restored for fertile pollen grain. So we would put that on the, on the stigmas, and hopefully it would germinate down and hit the egg and then fertilize, and then we get a seed from it. And actually, we did get that. Um, so we would, in, instead of trying to plant all this out we, to get data, um, uh, this is a seed that did not fertilize, and this one did. You can see the embryo right there, embryo, embryo. So we did get some uh, fertilization, and they've been planting these out. I need to contact them to see what came of that. But some of, the, some of them can become fertilized, not necessarily if you observe that you've got a new brood. Of right, right. They're, they're probably growing. This is probably now in the third year of growing out the seeds and, and the seedlings. So that's and good. That's good. I don't know what. You could do it and there's not nothing there. Right. Right. I mean, you could get a flower the first time, but forget about it. Exactly. Yep. So from bre for breeding, just to give you an idea, from making one cross to having a bulb that is saleable to the general public or a grower is between 15 and 20 years. So that's the sort of timeline it, that it takes to get all these. Yep. Seed to flower. The question is how long from seed to flower? Uh, can it be anywhere from two to three years, four to five? It, it all depends on the cross. It's just, just like humans, how fast we mature, and uh, certain individuals will mature a little faster, some will. So it's a lengthy process. Bulbs are definitely a lengthier process than some of the more herbaceous perennials or, or annuals. So, All right, and so part of this is to try to restore fertility, and we wanted a, con a cool uh, scientific way to confirm this hybridization is called a process you can use called GISH, uh, genomically uh, in situ hybridization. So what you do is you have parent one, you have parent two, you take uh, proteins and you tag them to their chromosomes that fluoresce a certain color. So the ones that are fluorescing here just say it's cultivar A, and the ones that are fluorescing pink are cultivar B. And so when, <clears throat> when they come together and you want, what you want is introgression of these to happen. So you want them to come together, the chromosomes to come together and share information and then pull apart. And so you want this right here. That's how you get the, ver the, the, the best genetic variation, the best chance of getting disease resistance or bigger flower, et cetera, et cetera. This is what you're looking for right here. So it's mostly blue, but there's a little spot of pink. That means we've got both, uh, both pieces of both, both parents. There's DNA on that chromosome, so that's going to add to the variation. It's really cool. I didn't get a chance to do this, but there's another one. Um, all this uh, genetic tagging and fluorescing is kind of cool. Um, but that, but that, that helps 
to shorten that process to figure out if it might be a good good thing to continue looking. Probably, probably, much of the probably yes, yes, absolutely. All right, so then we come up with all these new cultivars. Over time, uh, there are several growers, producers in the Netherlands, and then they have their own little shows to uh, showcase them to the exporters, to the people who want to buy them. And of course, they force them to be perfect. I mean, perfect height. Um, and then they have their shows, and people can rate them and then figure out if they want to continue production or not. Let it go to the compost. And as you can see, after a while, some of them start to look really similar. Some of them just might be sturdier stems, just hold up better, might be taller, maybe more disease resistant, that sort of a thing. So, uh, Tulips, they have classified several care, uh, groups of them. Single early, double early, triumph, Darwin hybrids, the Rembrandts, as I mentioned, parrot tulips, the Fosterianas, and they have a miscellaneous group, and then the lily flowered, so we'll just show you some. Here's the Veritifloras. Veritifloras have green in them. This is Greenland. Um, this is Angelique. It's a tulip, uh, a peony, or a double flowered tulip. This is a lily flowered tulip. I forgot the name. Um, this is Mariette. It's a bunch forming tulip, so it has four, perhaps five to one stem. Um, it's its own bouquet. And these are probably just Darwin hybrids, probably cottage or, or, um, or uh, uh, triumph tulips. And this here is one of the, some of the newer ones. So in the breeding process, what they're trying to do now is to uh, develop more perennial tulips. Um, I'll start, I'll get into the physiology here in a minute. Um, but they're working to get perennializing tulips. And this is one of them. It's called a French hybrid. And I forget, it's, I think it's something wine, but it has a really large flower, actually, probably four to five inches, actually, if it's grown well. Um, and tall, probably up to my waist. So, uh, and of course, <clears throat> here's a parrot, a black parrot. This is Queen of the Night, black. Uh, and this is close to blue, blue heron. It's a fringed one. If you remember the other fringed one, that one was much, much more fringed. This one's, this is one of the very first standard fringed ones. Um, and of course, there's a whole story behind the black tulip as well. Uh, Alexander Dumas has a book on that. Um, also relates to the tulip mania itself, but again, that could be a whole other lecture. So, and blue is, uh, of course, as in many flowers, blue and black are colors that people are always striving for. for. Uh, <coughs> oddity. So, all right, and this is just for interesting note. If you're ever in the Netherlands, how many have been in the Netherlands and see, have seen some of the bulb fields? I'm, I could go back every year, so I want to go back. But <coughs> if you get the chance, go north. Uh, Middle March all the way through the beginning of May, uh, give or take a week or two. Uh, if you want to be sure, go middle of April. You'll get it. Uh, if you get the chance, go up north to Limen. Uh, if you remember on that one map that was here, Amsterdam was here, Leiden was here, Limen was up here, up near <coughs> Alkmaar. Um, <coughs> they have the Living Museum, Hortus Bulborum. Uh, they have about 250 rare or historic, they keep a catalog of all these tulips. And so they have some of the oldest tulips verified that they're the old uh, original tulips. And they do possess some of the viral ones too. Uh, not to mention they carry some daffodils and uh, hyacinths as well, so. Yeah, they do. They lift them every year. They lift them up and they lift them, but they do sell them to people too. I, I might get into that sooner than later, but um, depending on how, so here's some of their gardens. Depending on how many, again, just like the, the tulip mania, depending on how, much, how good of a growing season it is and how good the, the bulbs they plant, they could have one bulb for sale this year, they could have none, or they could have 20. So, but they lift them every year to, to check the, the viability and to hopefully maintain that. Because if they're getting really low on it, they need to do, they need to save it and either do tissue culturing or something like that. <coughs> they can if bugs come in there, so that's why they are very cautious about that. But <coughs> they've been doing this for 50 years, almost. No, we're gonna get there. So I move, I'm going to move along. Right, We'll hold questions towards the end. I'm going to stop at least five minutes early. And I'll stick around, so if you're not moving on, I'll answer questions longer. So, Okay, so how do we go from these to these? I played around with some of the animation with this. I don't usually do this. So there's a beautiful bulb field in the Netherlands in Voorhout. Okay, so here we go. <coughs> they typically plant bulbs in about a four-foot-wide four bed, uh, mounded higher. And here you'll see this is more of a loamy soil. This is up in the northern, that northern section of the Netherlands that they probably are planting. Um, and they will, um, these are probably not tulips now that I look at it because, or it's an older picture, uh, because tulips, they'll just drive the machine over and they drop. 
Tulips, it doesn't matter if you plant point up or not. It'll find its way, it'll find its way up. Hyacinths, on the other hand, will not. They will actually go, what this, is, what this is right here is there's three or four people laying on their stomachs there, making sure the bulb is getting put boom, 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 right side up. They'll do that with hyacinths, but hyacinths are much more, they, they cost a lot more too, so. But tulips, generally, they dry this over. You can see the hopper of bulbs comes in here, and they dry this over, and the bulb just fall down, and then the, the soil gets pushed back over. Here's a little smaller uh, type tractor. Bulbs are placed up here, they drop down, and um, the, the wings here push the soil back in and mound the bed like that. And <clears throat> so you'll see sometimes uh, when you go to see the fields, if you go to the Netherlands, you'll see them out there chopping these off. There are so many bulb fields, you'll see color, but they actually go by and uh, pick them off. This is a more modern, a larger one. Why are they picking them off? Well, does anyone have an idea? Exactly. They don't, we don't, we're not interested in seeds, we're not interested, they're not interested in the color to be quite honest. They, they, want, they want the bulbs down there to get big. And so they'll leave them there for a week or two because then that brings in the tourists and they can see the big fields. And of course they have, uh, they have several varieties out there so you can have a wave of color that happens. But they'll come by and pick them off and this is def this must be a special variety but all, they're all kids. Um, a lot of early, before a lot of mechanization, school children did a lot of the work as you'll see in a couple of next slides too. So, what we just talked about, cutting the flowers off. This is your mother bulb. This is what would be planted, say, in the fall, and this is what usually comes up when they lift them in July. So this mother bulb has now turned into one, two, three. So this is a cross section of that, what would be this mother bulb. Right here, <coughs> here's some of the physiology of it, and it's gonna answer your question about perennialization and such. Here's that shoot that grows in the spring. The flower bulb, the flower bud is already in there. The flower bud is in there by July in August, and during that, during, when they lift them, they give them a heat treatment, and that helps set this flower bud in there. If they don't get that heat treatment, it won't have a flower. It'll still have leaves, but it won't have a flower. Uh, and it has to reach G stage, gynecium, the, the pistil. So this is already there, and if lighting's, oh, you can see it here, that's why I put it here. You see this little spot right here? So this is where that would be. This is one of these, this is the daughter bulb. So really what, in essence, what a lot of bulbs are, you have a, a, a plant has, uh, leaves, branches, stem, roots, okay? The bulb is sort of just compacted. This part right here, these, these scales are modified leaves. This basal plate right here, it's modified stem, it's just sort of squashed together. All the roots come out right from here. So if you think about a tree, and think of like a Christmas tree, the branches come out, and if you, you prune it, the little bud in the middle starts growing out. This here is exactly what that is. It's, a, it's an axillary bud. And so as this bulb is growing, it, it, the, the shoot comes up in the spring and then it flowers. And as it starts flowering, it use the, that, that season's flower, all these nutrients in here, all the starches and sugars that are converted go into helping that current season's flower. But as the leaves are up there, it's photosynthesizing and it's sending sh nutrients back down. It's sending nutrients back down to form these little guys, or little girls, I guess, daughter bulbs. Now, the mother bulb usually dies off and these little axillary buds start swelling and all those nutrients coming back down are developing these. And that's why they say to leave your tulip leaves on until they turn half yellow, half pinkish because then it's not really sending much, any more energy down. They've, they've developed about as much as they can. So if you're looking at this, you can get three. <clears throat> yeah, you can get three and depending on the cultivar, it can be three to four to five, depends on the cultivar. So that's why they cut the tulip tops off so this, you can maximize its bulb size. Okay, so now I have some videos, and these are gonna be really cool. At least one of them I'll show you. Okay, so this is bulb harvesting. And so, yep. So this is a lot, this is where uh, Martijn's place up in Kryl, up in that, in the new area of the Netherlands. So this is the sweeper, it's sweeping off the old stems. Here's the digger. And this is a blade under there that's lifting the soil and it's vibrating. You can see the soil dropping there and the bulbs are going into this top. Okay. Yep. So that's, that's the first video. <coughs> now we're going to see that they've lifted them all and they've, they're taking them back to the farm. And they're going into the hopper. Right there is the big tractor that they're going into. The hopper's dumped. Now they're going to be processed. So they're, they're vibrating. There's extra soil coming out to the side, they're back in the field. Tulip bulbs coming into water, 
big drum, spins them around, washes them. And we're going to move down this way. See the bulbs that come up there? <clears throat> yep. They come down, washed yet again, washed in there. Some float out, and then they go into these big dishes. So they're wet. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So then they go in these big bins. Um, oops, let me go back to the PowerPoint. And <clears throat> oh, so I put these in there because if I didn't get the videos to work, sorry. Um, so they're in the big bins. Now they're going to get dried down. They need to be dried down. They're going to heat them. And they're, these are huge, uh, like one uh, square meter boxes. Actually, lily bulb, lily bulb, tulip, um, and potato. Um, so these are the these are the big boxes. They're they're stored in these large, large rooms. And see these vents down here? They're stacked probably 20 deep by about eight high. And then they have large for, uh, forced heat that goes underneath. And they'll put uh, padding in there to help force it to go through and then up. So it's, it's about uh, 65, 70 degrees uh, going through there to help dry those bulbs. Because it's very important to get them dry as fast as possible. Otherwise, uh, bacteria and other diseases will set in and then kills the bulbs. OK? So, there's an okay picture of those big crates all together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's this video? Oh, this is the video of um, now that they've been dried and they're going to uh, go out to market or to a grower. It might be a little dark. This is at Martine's place itself. So they have that large box of bulbs coming in. Okay. Sorry, this is not the best. But they're going through here. <clears throat> they're getting sorted. Some drop out there. I don't know what those were, to be honest. They come down. Here are students on a small belt, and they're, they're pulling off extra large stems that are still there, because back there, there were little rollers that pinched those off. And they come through here, see this bouncer? This is the grater. So it's a rule that no bulb less than 10 uh, uh, centimeters in circumference can come out of the metal one. So anything less than that has to go back to the metal one. They cannot sell it. And they, these are all graters. So I think 10 to, 10 to 11 centimeters, 11 to 12, 12 to 30. So they bounce all the way down, uh, second check, <coughs> and then they're sorted into their appropriate size crates. That's, well, this is a small firm. A large firm, they don't have that much manual labor. No, this is a small firm. The small ones go back to be planted. That's what you see out in the field. So if they're, if they're really, really small, they won't flower as well, but they, they typically keep records of what the minimal size is for them to get two to three more daughter bulbs for the next year to keep sales going. Um, okay, so, okay, I'm doing all right. So there's some of the bulbs, again, pictures uh, bouncing through. These are hyacinths, I just put that in there for, so hyacinths, a lot of people can be allergic to them, the dust from them, touching them. So these, when they start, boun whoops, when they start bouncing, they keep a cover on there in a vacuum. Um, so some people just, they smell it and they break out. Um, but that's hyacinths. And so then, <coughs> excuse me, they have bulbs in all these. They usually have the, the person who grew them, where they're from, and the date. But that's all mixed up now. So those are the bulbs that are ready to go out. Um, they either go into these packages that are going to go retail, or these packages for bulk retail. Or they go into these crates uh, and boxes that are in a storehouse that are going to go for shipment, get put in a container. They get put on a big boat. Uh, there are thousands of containers there. Um, and it takes about five to seven days for it to come from uh, Europe to Newark, uh, Port Elizabeth. That's where the bulbs come in. Really? Yep. Uh, so most of them come in, I think. So, all right. So I'm going to whiz through this just a little bit, <coughs> and then I'll stop for some questions. So the harvested bulbs that we, we just saw all that happen, what happens to those harvested bulbs? They either go to a greenhouse grower, whether it's in the UK, Japan, Europe, or here in the United States. Uh, or they'll go to a retail outlet or for retail, or they go back to planting for, their, for, for the next year's stock. And if a greenhouse grower gets them, they're either going to go as potted tulips <coughs> or for cut flower. And so part of what the, they're doing, the potted tulips, yeah, you get the, the ones that you can buy and put on your table. But something that's been very popular or gaining popularity in the last five years is if you forget to plant them in the fall, they do it for you. So you get a six pack or eight pack of uh, bulbs. You just set, most of the time you just set them on the ground. You don't even bother to plant them, and you just mulch around them, and then you just pick up that little thing and either compost. They're making a lot of compostable materials, and then it's pretty slick. So everyone forgets to plant the bulbs in the fall. They don't. They think they plant your bulbs in the spring. No, you have to do it in the fall because they need that cold period. Um, 
So that, or they go to cut flower. <coughs> All right, how am I doing? Okay, so this is gonna, quick info. So if they're going to cut flower or, or yeah, cut flower, uh, one of them, uh, an easy way to do it is hydroponically, no soil at all. Uh, just growing on uh, calcium nitrate solutions. <clears throat> These are little pin boards. You just poke the bulb down. Um, there's a whole little mess of them in their bulb tray or bulb crate. Uh, give them a couple weeks of cold with that calcium nitrate solution. Then you bring. They're already pre-chilled, so bulbs need tulip bulbs need at least 12 weeks of cold, less than less than 50 degrees, at least. Cold, less than 50. 40 is even better just to ensure that cold. Um, 12 weeks is the bare minimum for some cultivars, some will require 15 or plus. Exactly, exactly. And there's, yet we have a, a few benches full and they're growing pretty well. Uh, a little bit farther. And this is a, this is a large commercial production in, in the Netherlands. These just came out, this came out of the cooler, you can see how they stretched and they're pretty yellow. Within 24 hours they'll be completely green. Uh, that's pretty, probably them in about 24 hours. I got these from Dr. Miller. Um, but you can see they green up no problem, <coughs> and they're almost ready to har almost ready to bloom. Uh, and there you see them blooming, and what they do is they go through these mechanized belts that go all the way up to the main aisle. Uh, so these workers just pull them out, they go on the belt, they come up, they're pulling, and then they go to this other belt where they're bunched in groups of five or ten, whatever they're <coughs> whatever they're going to sell them as. And there's a little saw over here, so. It, snips these off and wraps them, wraps them at the same time. And then there's either a person or probably a machine now that just drops them in their sleeve and then somebody puts them in these buckets. These are the carts that go to the auction. Or if, they're, if they have a, a glut of flowers at one point in time, they can store them. They'll just put them in crates, keep them cold, and then when they have a cultivar that hasn't come in quite yet, they'll pull these out and then send those off to the market so they don't flood the market so much. And there are some, leaving the roots on is pretty key. Um, because there's a still a lot of uh, carbohydrates in there. The flower can, it's still respiring, it's still doing its thing, but there are carbohydrates there that this can maintain that, especially when you cool it down, it should be sufficient. Okay, um, <coughs> this is the flower auction, which is the Allsmere one, which is the largest, but it's now actually one auction. There's Flora Holland, which has like six or seven locations around the Netherlands, but it's all one now, and this is the largest, the Allsmere one, just outside of Schiphol or uh, Amsterdam. Um, 450 acres, about 12 football fields. They are current, last I heard, they are uh, constructing a tunnel. So the airport's over here, constructing a tunnel underneath that the, all the cargo can just go under, they don't have to go around to go to the airport and deal with all normal traffic. They just go directly to the airport. <coughs> Schiphol is one of the largest European, well, one of the largest airports in the world, and a lot of cargo goes out of it. Um, so the cut flower is going from there. There's 39 clocks, lots of flowers. I didn't do, this is just general, I don't have tulip data there. Um, but 20% of the world's flowers at, this was probably 19, or uh, 2006 or 7, 20% of the world's flowers went through Alzheimer at that time. Um, and so, I have to get to the table, right? So they get, oh, crap. They go from the auction, get loaded on FedEx, here's some flowers in boxes, um, get loaded on the FedEx from the auction to the florist to their cooler in, in about a day, could be less than a day depending on where they're coming from and when they're ordered, and then to your tabletop after you go there. Um, there's one thing I haven't mentioned. Anyone know what this is? Yep, deer, this little guy. Um, so that's perhaps one of the next breeding projects someone could do for a lifetime. I considered it for my PhD, but I didn't want to be here that long. I've been here long enough. Yep. So. Yes, somebody started working on that. Um, so just a few resources. Uh, check out our flower bulb research. It's outdated, but it's being updated soon. There are, there are articles on there. Dr. Miller's got things. Uh, Hort.cornell.edu, Miller bulbs. If you Google uh, Cornell Hort greenhouse webcam, you'll get this, our flower bulb research program. Um, they, like I just said, we have a greenhouse camera where you can um, <coughs> look at our greenhouse growing, and you can see the flowers moving, or us working. Um, uh, the IBC, the International uh, Flower Bulb Center, has a really good website where you can get information uh, about trends and, and what's coming, what's happening. Really cool. They've really updated it and they've updated it well. Their old site was crappy. Um, the bulb project that's going on in our department, Craig is a, a major part of that, Marsha is, for uh, cool projects to do with yourself, with your, with your children or your grandchildren. 
um, blogs and everything. And so that's it. The only thing I need to do is my video. So, and I'm one minute early. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.